Hi everyone and welcome to the second part of the Azure Dataprex Networking Deep Dive. In this part, we will continue our discussion uh, for the Dataprex Networking and we will focus on the uh, private endpoints. If you didn't watch the first uh, part, the link should be here and uh, the, in the description as well, I'm going to put the, the links for the previous and the coming part because I'm not expecting to finish everything in this part. I'm expecting a third part as well. So in, in this one, we'll start by the, the whiteboard as usual, and we'll see how can we link the private endpoints and what's the function exactly that we are achieving from it. Starting with the whiteboard, and we'll see here the, the three uh, network zones. The control plane, this is a network zone on, on and operated by uh, Databrex, you don't control it. The data plane, this is your own VNet, so this is a representation for your own VNet. And here is the network that is the, the users are connecting from, and that's your own VNet as well. This part is the part that you don't have control over, which is the uh, the control plane. Now, we saw in the previous video that we can have the traffic going from the, uh, the data plane to the control plane if we have an SG that is allowing the traffic going to the uh, network tag uh, that is called Databricks. Okay, so the service, the service, it's actually called service tags in, in Azure. So as long as we have the Databricks service tag enabled, we have allowing this traffic, then the machines here can communicate with the control plane. Now, if we don't have this, and that's the first demo that we are having, the expected behavior is it will fail. We saw this last uh, last part, and then I will we'll show this this again. But this time I'm gonna fix it with something different. This time what I will do is I'm gonna create a private endpoint from the service to here, private endpoint, and here I'm gonna put this into a subnet, I will call it private endpoints. It can be anything, it can be called anything, just a, I, I called it private endpoints. Now, as long as there is no uh, um, any barrier between these subnets, because your cluster is here, and uh, the, the network that or the subnet that has the private endpoints, the traffic is allowed between these, then the traffic will take this route, as long as it takes this route. Of course, private endpoints meaning there has to be a DNS zone. Private DNS zone. So there has to be a private DNS zone, link it to this network, and these machines, every time they are asking for what is the IP for Databricks, it will send them to the private IP, not the public IP, so the traffic will go this way, okay? This is the first demo that we will see right now. Let's go for the demo. This is the workspace that we created before without the NSG outbound rule that allows the traffic going to the service tag for Databricks. So the cluster failed when we tried to create it. Now going back to the same one, I will go to network configuration and create a private endpoint. In the screen, we'll choose a name and the region. It has to be the same region as the workspace. In the next screen, the resource is chosen for us uh, by, by default. And then the sub-resource, we have two options, Dataprex UI API and browser authentication. We will always use Dataprex UI API for both front-end private endpoint and back-end private endpoint. For the browser authentication, we will discuss it later as a complementary endpoint one time only per region for the front end. Choose the virtual network and subnet and then the private DNS zone and that would be it. I'm going to speed up. <laughs> 
until the operation finishes. Done. Go and check. It's there. Approved and everything is ready. Now we'll go to the Databricks workspace. We'll see our cluster that has failed since before. Uh, we will leave this cluster. We'll actually delete it and create a new cluster. So we'll go ahead and create a new cluster, personal cluster as well. Create. And we'll delete the old failed cluster. There's no point to continue with this one because it will not continue. It's in consistent state now. Now, it will take a few minutes and I'm going to sp speed up the video. But this is the demo for the back-end private endpoint. What we just achieved now, the back-end private endpoint between the control plane and the data plane. And it's ready. Driver is healthy and everything is ready to start. Back to the whiteboard and quickly what we just created right now and experienced is this. This private endpoint and this is what we call back-end private endpoint. The back-end is between the control plane and the data plane. This is what we call back-end. Then what's the front-end? The front-end is between the user network and the control plane. So there is another private endpoint here that will take this area uh, that we will create later and that will be the, the front end private endpoint, but we will not discuss it now. That will be for the next step, which is how, how can we secure the or, or isolate the access between the user and the workspace. First, we will just uh, create this one. This is the back end private endpoint and that isolate the traffic between uh, the, the control plane and the data plane. Now, before we leave this point, I want to go and do some checking over what we created so far. So what we see here, this is our workspace and I can see in the networking part, private endpoints, this is the network, this is the private endpoint and it's connected to Databricks VNet and the subnets called private endpoints. Okay, now if you check in this subnet, so it's, let's click here actually and see the connected devices. You will see there is only one connected device here. And if you look here at the network interface, you will see that the, the IP for this network interface is 10.0.3.4, right? And it's attached to this uh, network. Okay, everything is okay from this side. Now there is one thing we need to check as well the private DNS zone. So for the connection to work, there has to be this network here, the data plane network has to be connected to a private DNS zone that is uh, registering this IP. So let's see it. Let's go here. And this is the private DNS zone. If you look, see the virtual network links, we'll find that the network is connected, the private DNS zone is connected to a Databricks VNet, right? And if you go here in the overview, you will see there is one entry, 10.0.3.4, this is the IP, and the name, you will see that this name is actually the same name of the uh, workspace. So this workspace, this is the workspace ID, and this is the name of the workspace. Proof, proof. Let's take this copy. Go to our workspace overview, and here you go. It's actually encoded into the URL. And if you go to the JSON, and you do the same thing. The workspace ID. This is the ID of the workspace, and this is the URL of this workspace. So now we see how the connection happened between the the uh, control plane back end private the uh, private endpoint connected to a subnet that is that has a, a clear path for the communication between the two subnets for the data for the data plane and this subnet if you created anything here for example 
a routing going to a firewall or an NSG that is that is not allowing the traffic to pass between the subnet one, subnet two, and the private endpoint, then it will fail back again. If you remove the connection to this private DNS zone, it will fail again, right? If if you did so, you have to replace it with something else. If you remove the private DNS zone, then you have to replace it with something else, right? All right. So far, we secure the communication between the control plane and the data plane. What about between the user and the control plane? This communication can be secured by two ways. One is the IP access list. IP access list is basically an, what the name suggests, IP access list. It's an access list that we enable. We say these IPs are enabled, these IPs are blocked, and if the, uh, if the IP that is it's not explicitly enabled, then your access will be disallowed. Fair enough. This way we can have the VPN IP, for example, so everyone has to connect to the VPN, and then the outgoing or the default gateway for the VPN, that would be the IP. Now we make sure that everyone is using the corporate hardware, and they are using the VPN, because typically the VPN client is working only by using a certificate provided by the workplace. This is one. Two, uh, using private endpoint. In this case, we will call it the front-end private endpoint. In the rest of this video, we'll discuss the IP access list, and in the coming part, we'll discuss the private or the front-end private endpoint. Let's see. Back to our workspace, and if you look at the network configuration, you will find that public access is enabled, and it cannot be disabled after the creation. You have to decide this at the creation time. Uh, however, we can use the IP access list. To use the IP access list, we have to use REST APIs for the workspace. You can't use it with any other SDK or command line. To communicate with the REST API, you need to have the URL for the workspace. This is the URL. This is one. Second, we need to have an access token. Luckily, this is one of the operations that works well with the Azure AD access token. We don't need to have the personal access token from the workspace itself. And, but we can use this, use the Azure AD. To get the Azure AD access token, all what you need to do is to use this commandlet from the Azure, uh, command, from Azure module. Make sure that the resource is the same resource here. You see the resource, this specific GoIt, this resource is used to represent the Databricks enterprise uh, application. Now, since we have everything we need, the access token and the URL, we'll start communicating with REST API. I'm using VS Code extension called REST Client, and the first uh, REST API I'm gonna call is called the Workspace Configuration, and I'm asking for Enable IP Access List. Sending this GET request, I'm returning, I'm getting the response back that is null, which means it's not configured yet. So let's give it a try and configure it. Uh, it's a patch request, and I'm getting 204 response, that means it was accepted. Uh, then let's go back and check what's the status now. Call again the uh, workspace conf config, and it's true. That means we enabled the IP access list. All right, since I enabled the IP access list, I need to test it. Will I be able to access the workspace? And it seems I can. Okay, so why? This is by design. If, if the IP access list does not have any IPs yet, then it's not really effective. All the IPs will be allowed. Once you add any one IP in the access list, then it would be enforced. In this case, we didn't have anything yet. Then let's return back and add one IP. The IP that I chose here is actually, as you can see, 192.168. This is an internal IP. However, it gives me an error message. Why? Because it tells me that my public IP from the location that I'm in right now is not in the access list. If I allow this, then my own IP will not be able to access the workspace. Again, this is another safety measure. So the first IP that you need to add, it should be the IP that you are currently communicating from to the workspace. Otherwise, it will not accept it from you. Okay. So let's do it. Now it's done. It changed my IP and it gives me that it is, it is done now. 
let's do a testing, launch the workspace, and it should be working fine because I'm still connecting from the same IP. However, if I connect it from another machine, I have another machine that is in Azure, I'm getting this error message that tells me that my IP, which is the IP for the virtual machine I'm hosting in Azure, is not allowed to access the workspace. Okay. Now, uh, what about, let, let's test it if we disable the uh, the IP access list. So let's do it again, get back again to our uh, REST APIs and then disable it, accept it. Let's go and check, refresh. It's not effective yet. Okay, while it's refreshing, like it, it will take, typically it takes between 30 seconds or a minute. So I'm returning back and checking what's the status of my IP access list. Send the request. I'm getting back IP access list is disabled. Okay, so by this time, let's go back and refresh. And voila. Now I can access the workspace. So this is in summary, how to use the IP access list using the REST APIs. What we have seen in this video so far is using the backend private endpoint to secure the communication between the control plane and the data plane. And from the user to the control plane, we are securing it by using the IP access list. And I showed you how to code the REST APIs for this. For the REST APIs uh, that I used, I will, I will try to document them in my blog and I will have the blog uh, link in the description for this video. So check it out once I publish the video. And in the next part, we will discuss using the private endpoint, but this time for the front end, not the back end. We'll, we'll have a complete uh, private endpoint communication. So private end, uh, back uh, front end, private endpoint, back end, private endpoint. And then we'll see how to take this further by incorporating Azure Firewall as well. See you next video.